Okay, let's say a prayer and we'll get started. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, the only begotten Son and Word of the Father, who brought all creation into existence, visible and invisible, for our sake and through your ineffable love for mankind, you voluntarily accepted death, uh, delivering us from the power of darkness through your precious blood. Grant that we may always walk in the fear of you and fill us with acceptance and praise of your will in all things. Grant that our good works bear fruit and that we grow in the knowledge of your truth. And with joy, delight, and thanksgiving, we may keep the commandments of the gospel of your grace through the prayers and intercessions of our all-glorious lady, the Theotokos, who gave birth to you without seed now and forever into ages of ages. Amen. Okay. I have a few more people to let into the party. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. There we go. Okay, here we are. So today we're going to continue what we talked about last week, and uh, a couple of you sent some good questions. So we're going to go over really a continuation in some ways of last week, uh, and, and then that'll give us a foundation for looking at the questions. So I'm going to sh uh, share my screen here with you in just a second, so you'll be able to see my slides. Okay, can everybody see that? Nod your head if you can see that. Yes. All right, good. Okay, so uh, something I wanted to talk about today, I, really has to do with the process of inviting people uh, into uh, the experience of the faith. And as, as I said before, if we really summarize what uh, evangelism is and what outreach is, especially evangelistic outreach, it is the uh, inviting people into the experience, a spiritual experience, right? The experience of the life of the church. And we have a tendency uh, sometimes uh, when it when it comes to sharing the faith to really kind of pick the low hanging fruit. Like we think of, um, especially when it comes to introducing people to orthodoxy into the ancient church, uh, we often think of people that are already Christian that we know. You know, like I have this Baptist friend, and they read the Bible all the time, um, and many people do respond right who are. Uh, Christian in some way, but we have to realize that our society is increasingly non-Christian, right? So a, a significant number of people identify as none, people with, with no religious affiliation at all, uh, spiritual but not religious, sometimes really dabbling in a lot of different uh, types of uh, spiritual uh, experiences and some of them contradictory i mean you can have people that uh do zen meditation and yoga which are really ba based on i mean very very different um religious beliefs but uh we we tend to kind of gravitate toward people that we think are are uh, responsive and what i put together is is, is a some questions that we can ask about the people that we know because everybody needs Christ. And uh, sometimes there are people that are around us that, uh, that we just don't think about. So what I like to do is have a strategy in which we can think about people in different ways, the people that we know that are around us, our friends and our, our colleagues, and acquaintances, uh, really just to jar our memory. 
to help us think about people that we might not put on a list. If I ask you, you know, who are the top maybe three people you might invite to church? These people might not be on there and they might kind of be off your radar screen. So what I, I try to do are a few things. One is, I mean, it's good sometimes to make a just a list. Uh, and if you're interested, I can send these out to you. But the, these are uh, ju just, as I said, uh, categories. Not that we're trying to divide people into categories, but categories of people, uh, relationships that we have with people uh, that really help us come up with names of people that, that we might, might think about so, and pray for. So, you know, we have family members. We have friends, we have acquaintances, right? There are people that are that are friends of friends that are same sort of social circle that we're in. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I have a few friends that I uh, keep in contact with through social media that I only know because they went to law school with one of my one of my best friends and uh we we really in fact at one time a bunch of these people that went to uh law school uh in a different state came home with my friend and they actually we invited them over to our house and i've been friends with some of them uh for years uh so and there are people that might be former church members you know from before we became orthodox or uh became a catechumen uh, classmates former classmates co-workers all these different types of of people, you know, and if, if we start thinking about categories of people and start just, just jotting down names of people we think about, uh, that can help sometimes uh, bring to mind those that we could introduce to the faith that just might not be uh, the first people that we would normally think about. And, and the interesting thing is we never know who's going to respond to the gospel, right? We assume that someone who already has some Christian underpinning some Christian background, or someone who's very excited about the faith might be interested in deepening their faith. Uh, but sometimes someone who seems really zealous actually is, is pretty content and, and really pretty close-minded at anything that doesn't fit into their preconceived construct so that uh, it's very difficult uh, to... Uh, to get them really to move anywhere from where they already are. And yet you can find somebody who really has no religious background at all or experiments in different religious philosophies uh, who is really open and, and doesn't have all the baggage. You know, when I uh, deal with people who don't have a religious background or who are at least not Christian, they ask entirely different questions than people who are uh, are Protestant. You know, my wife had no religious background. There's a few um, Buddhists in, in the family, but no, uh, no Christian background, certainly. And uh, not many people, at least uh, in her generation, maybe her parents' generation, that are really devout. Uh, and when uh, coming to Orthodoxy, there are things like the, the place of the Virgin Mary, uh, prayer to the saints, uh, liturgical worship, like none, of, none of these things, uh, you know, raise any red flags. But those of us who are Protestant, right, uh, much, much of uh, our uh, religious system was based on a reaction of Roman Catholicism. So we have to kind of work out because uh, like the Roman Catholicism flag goes off. So we have to kind of uh, learn how Orthodoxy sees things differently uh, than, than Roman Catholicism does. But you get people who have no background at all or, or a non-Christian background, and, and they just learn it. I mean, that, you know, that is Christianity for them, and it's a very natural sort of thing. So we can think about uh, as our relationships to other people, try to think about the different relationships, uh, and also religious groups. As I said, we may know people that are Protestant, that are evangelical, charismatic, reform, or Calvinist. Uh, Wesleyan. Wesleyan is more like Methodist, Church of the Nazarene, um, the Holiness Movement, and Roman Catholic. And then you have people that uh, can be classified as new religious movements or, or pseudo-Christian cults, uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science. Uh, those are religions that really claim to be 
uh, Christian, at, le at least Mormons, you really used to, I think, distinguish themselves from those who call themselves Christians, but uh, as of late have become more interested in kind of being included in, in, the, uh, in the terminology of Christian. But they're uh, religions that are really substantially depart from historic Christian doctrine to the point that we really see them as very different religions. And you usually have a prophet or a prophetess who is um, uh, claiming teachings that are really far from historic teaching, even not only from, from an Orthodox perspective, but also from Roman Catholic and Protestant perspective. And then you have uh, Buddhists and Taoists. I mean, people who may not be devout, they may be, uh, they may not be devout, but they're sort of gravitate toward these religions. Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Wiccan, right? Witchcraft is a big deal uh, right now. And uh, there are those that practice witchcraft that they think uh, goes back to Britain uh, or to Western Europe. Often that's, that's really not true. Modern witchcraft doesn't go that, that far back uh, as, a, as, a, as a system. Uh, and then there's an interest, increased interest in African spirituality and uh, things like voodoo and, and so on. Uh, that is become much more prevalent. It's sort of uh, like the New Age movement of the 80s in, in many ways. Uh, and I put New Age spiritual, uh, spirituality on there. People that, again, have no religious background, people that are agnostic, they sort of don't know if God exists, and, but they, I mean, they're, they may be as certain that they can't say that God exists or doesn't exist. Um, and then we have people that are Marxists, right? There are a lot of people that identify with socialism. I mean, some people just identify with being like a social Democrat, right? Just using tax money to benefit everybody. Uh, but then there are those, if you really buy into Marxism at the core of Marxism is really, is, is atheism, right? Marxism really replaces religion, but it's kind of a sliding scale. There are people that might identify as socialists, but really not, not go that far, uh, and even between Soviet and Chinese expressions of communism, there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, or people that are, that, that are atheists, right? People that are atheists tend often to be uh, rather resistant, but, but you never know. And beyond underlying atheism a lot of times, uh, even though uh, atheists often think that they base all of their uh, beliefs on reason, there is uh, often a, a hurt and emotional soul underneath that, right? So I, I, many athe atheists, although they think it's, it's pure reason, it's all, it's, there, there's something else going on there. Uh, we can think about those who have different medical professions. Uh, sometimes we're in, in particular circles uh, where we, we know uh, those that are in our profession or uh, or someone else. I mean, my, my wife's a physician, so a lot of my friends, uh, our friends, are, are physicians. Uh, there's health medical, right? There's, and you might you know physicians or nurses or people that do teach Pilates or, or fitness uh, or, or martial arts. There are people that do tech, right? They're in restaurants. And we, we often think, you know, in, in many Orthodox circles, I think if we try to think of someone who might be interested in orthodoxy, we go for the person who like likes to read books like this thick, you know, and, and those that we think are really intellectual. But, you know, what about the barista, right, at Starbucks, if we know that person, or we have, you know, some relationship with someone who just works in retail or is a waiter or a waitress or something, right? Orthodoxy is for everybody. Right? It's, it's not just for people who think they're intellectual. Uh, and in fact, part of learning orthodoxy is realizing that orthodoxy is not rational philosophy. And uh, it, it's, it's, about, it's about the heart. The heart is the center of the person, right? The spirit and not the rational mind. And uh, until we get, if, if we don't learn that, uh, then, then we have the problem of portraying orthodoxy as though being orthodox is about being philosophically right about doctrine. And orthodoxy is about God changing you, God healing you and transforming who you are. That's what orthodoxy is about. So, and, and in fact, one of the, uh, the problems I think that we have right now in orthodoxy 
there are those who just really like pointing out that other people are wrong and we're right, but they miss, they miss the point. All the doctrine that we, we hold to is there to lead us on the path of spiritual experience, right? So that we become who we are, who we can be uh, beyond who we are right now. I spelled government wrong, even though I work for the government. It's my little act of rebellion there. Administration, uh, education, teaching, all of these things. Uh, people that are unemployed, right? So uh, we can just make lists of, of uh, professions and, uh, and ethnic communities. You know, uh, in the, now the thing about being in an ethnic community, uh, and again, you know, all of this is not, it's not about d- dividing people because quite frankly, most of my friends, uh, uh, many of my friends who are Orthodox, who we hang out with are at, at least, if, if not in an interracial marriage, interracial family are bicultural. Um, you know, I mean, being a hillbilly from West Virginia, I'd be bicultural if I married somebody from New Jersey, right? But we're, we're pretty uh, multicultural. Uh, so my wife is born in China. Uh, and if you're in a particular community, you might not even think of people that are um, in the same community, right? I grew up where everybody's white. Everybody's so you, white. you know, you don't think about being white if everybody's white. And we've been really good in the Church of Antioch, in our archdiocese in the United States, at reaching uh, middle to upper class educated white people since about the 1980s. That has been, uh, in fact, if you pick up a lot of books, uh, it assumes a lot of our pamphlets, sometimes really they're answering the questions of people who uh, are often educated and who are uh, formerly evangelical, right? That's why you have lots on, on Mary. And, 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 by the way, make sure your, your mute button is on unless you're talking so we don't get a lot of background noise. I say that, but I think last, last week my dog was in here whining. He got stuck in my room. Uh, so, you know, you can think about, again, uh, when we, we, uh, with evangelism, uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure the gospel doesn't just stay with our ethnic community. And I have to tell you, in, in our archdiocese, for those of you who haven't been around a while or you're a catechumen or inquirer, um, our uh, previous metropolitan, metropolitan Philip, uh, blessed memory, he was uh, a man who emphasized evangelism. And you may have heard the story. We had about 2,000 evangelicals become Orthodox at once. Many of them were involved in Campus Crusade for Christ. They were leaders in Campus Crusade for Christ. They were looking, uh, they were researching the early church. And then someone read what they were writing and said, guys, we're like, the, we've always been here. Like the early church hasn't gone anywhere. And uh, we received them into the church of, of Antioch. And uh you know, many, many of us have kind of come in on their, on their coattails in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and Metropolitan Philip said something really profound because as Antiochians, right, we at our core, our church is headquarters in, in Syria. Uh, in fact, we moved the headquarters from old Antioch, from the original city of Antioch, to Damascus uh, a long time ago. But many of our parishes are still, uh, can be very Middle Eastern. And uh, Lebanese or Syrian, we have a lot of Palestinians at St. George, uh, which are, of course, uh, historically from the Church of Jerusalem. And uh, he said that, you know, we have to get out of our little ethnic ghettos. And he told those that were coming into the Orthodox Church, you have to do something about it. And he he put uh, converts in charge of evangelism in our archdiocese, so that really helped a lot of us becoming Orthodox because we, a lot of our, a lot of our material uh, was built really by those who came in, uh, were received into the Orthodox Church, and we always had to be careful about being an ethnic ghetto. And and I always like to say, you know, a a, a white convert church is just as ethnic as an Arab church or a Greek church. It really can be, right? And what we want to do, though, uh, and Houston's a great place for this, is to reach out because orthodoxy is for everybody. So as we try to think about names of people that we know, you know, as I said, we can make we can think about their relationship to us and their people that work in different jobs and, and all of that. And we can also think about 
those that are in different communities, white community, Hispanic, Latino community, and think about how can we reach more into these communities, right? And there's a lot more we can do. I mean, we have, you know, representatives from different groups, but have we really substantially reached many of these groups? We've really been focusing on evangelicals, I would say more than any, any group perhaps in our archdiocese, but it is certainly time uh, that we go out even more, right, into the uh, Hispanic community and to, I mean, we, we live in old Mexico, right? We should certainly do this in Houston, right? Uh, the black uh, community, uh, certainly, I put black and African-American because we also have, you know, a sizable African immigrant population in the United States. It's actually an incredible uh, percentage uh, these days. And um, a friend of mine wrote a book. I, I put it up on our St. George Outreach Facebook page uh, on uh, African-American spirituality and orthodoxy, Father Paul Abernathy, who is part uh, Black and part Syrian. So um, if you've met Bishop Thomas, I think he's a, a cousin of Bishop Thomas. Um, but Father Paul runs the Neighborhood Resilience Project along with St. Moses, the Black Orthodox Church in the Hill District of Pittsburgh. So it's really, uh, he's there really to, to serve the, uh, the Black community uh, historic community in Pittsburgh. And there's so much more we can do. Uh, I have a, a real love, as you may guess, from the East Asian community, um, the Chinese community, a, a Japanese community. One of our members in our uh, community here in Houston is a Japanese American uh, whose father was put in an internment camp uh, during the war and who joined the U.S. Army and has a, a fascinating story of being in China during World War II as a American soldier of Japanese descent, uh, Korean community, Vietnamese community. Uh, and this, that's not even including the, the South Asian community, which I listed. Um, there's a lot more to work, work to do uh, with Middle Easterners uh, and uh, those from Africa and immigrants um, who, you know, they're immigrants that really have a close connection to their, uh, the culture of the place where they came from. Uh, if they're first generation, they're those that are second generation, some third generation that have also a strong cultural connection, especially if they have family overseas. Uh, and then there are those who, you know, who live here, who immigrated, it might be second generation, but they really don't have a connection overseas, right? Um, it, it really depends. There's actually a distinction between like American born Chinese and people born in China uh, who, who grow up in China and come here. I mean, the, the views are often very different and uh, they experience uh, Chinese culture differently and American culture differently uh, sometimes. And again, all of this is not about categorizing. Like we have to fit people in like one or the other. But like I said, a lot of us, a lot of our families are multiracial, multi-ethnic. It's all about just thinking about names of people that we can reach. And uh, you, you might, you know, you might do this exercise and like, oh, you know, I know this guy uh, who's from Nigeria. Maybe I can talk to him, right? And I know I got some comments and questions. I'll take this in a second. Again, this is family. This is basic stuff. But they're single people we know, divorced people, second marriage. I mean, you know, again, these are all all ways of just trying to come up uh, with names. So uh, that's a little exercise that I like to try. And 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 interestingly enough, I mean, this this is just kind of a uh, really a psychological exercise of coming up with names. But uh, it's it's very similar. If you're familiar with Billy Graham, I once I once uh, volunteered when I was a Protestant. Uh, for a uh, the local office of a Billy Graham crusade that was about to be to be launched, and I think I was present maybe the first time Billy Graham and his son and his grandson had actually been on stage together. Will Graham, uh, but you know, you ever wonder like how they get all these people in the stadium, and they have a very simple um, exercise where they just take they have people write down three names and pray for those names. And then invite those people uh, to like, you know, this massive event. And, uh, and that, that, that worked well, at least at one time. You know? Think about evangelism is, is <laughs> it changes, right? The way the cause the culture changes, our, our approach uh, changes as well. But so this is, this is, is actually a technique that has been uh, well used, the idea of coming up with names. We're not inviting anybody to uh, a, a, a massive stadium, not yet. Uh, I have a friend 
who's an Orthodox priest who used to do that. He used to, uh, when he was a Protestant, used to, I mean, fill stadiums with people and do that kind of evangelism. Uh, and actually, as an Orthodox priest, would go over to like uh, post-Soviet, I think Eastern Europe, and uh, and and do some very similar work. So uh, yeah, I, I know I missed attorneys on that list. I think I thought attorneys, and I didn't put it on there. But you leave it. That's one of the comments. You leave leave it to an attorney to point that out. So I didn't put priests on there either. But but we we were already a church, hopefully. So. Um, or clergy, right? That a lot of the people that I actually talk to about orthodoxy are uh, are other clergy, uh, and or or those who at least work in churches in Protestant churches. Um, and and, and we're talking. Another question is, what does the model of evangelism look like in the context of orthodoxy? And that's really uh, what all this is about. And 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 some of that I may answer, right? I mean. Again, the, if we look at orthodoxy, orthodox evangelism, right, we started looking at the preaching of St. Peter and Paul and, um, and talking about how, really how orthodoxy is um, that which we, we invite people into, right? We're inviting people into the experience of God, into, into the ancient church. Uh, so... Again, it's not, it's, it's different from um, what we think of often as evangelism, where, you know, we put pressure on people. You know, I grew up where we played music like Just As I Am. Some of you might know that Protestant hymn, right? And there are a few others that I talked to somebody, uh, you know, I, I talk to people from my background. And, um, you know, th those, those hymns are very common because they're, what happens is they're, is a, a sermon given, right, and often, and that sermon is really about, like, applying this sort of pressure for you to respond, right, and, and you respond by saying this prayer. It's like, and, and even in individual one-on-one -on -one evangelism, sometimes there's a lot of pressure to get you to say a certain prayer, right? It's like you got to seal the deal. It's like selling something, right? And we don't, we're not doing that. Like, we're not selling something. I mean, Conversion happens by the Holy Spirit, right? We, we talk about what God has done, and we can testify what God has done in us and our experience, and, and we let God do his work, and that, that's, that's evangelism, right? So, uh, and there are a lot of different ways. It's not that just, there is not just one way of evangelism, but one, one difference is in orthodoxy, right? We bring people... Uh, we bring people to the faith, and, and it's been the tradition for a long time, right, for people to sort of go through these stages, first in an inquirer, someone who's really looking at orthodoxy and learning about it initially, and then a person decides, I want to be a catechumen. That means a student, a learner. I want to learn the faith, and being a catechumen is really, it's about training. It's about learning how the orthodox worship, learning uh, the, the ethics of living, learning how to pray learning how we treat one another, right? Learning uh, as much as we can as catechumens, the doctrine, the apostolic doctrine we're, we're to preserve. And then after that period of training, then uh, we are received into the church, right? Through the, through the mystery, the mystery of uh, baptism, or in some cases, if one has been received by baptism through the mystery of uh, holy, holy chrismation. And by the way, the Orthodox, we do not accept baptism outside of the church. If you are chrismated, what that means is you're baptized in the name of the Trinity with water, which is, is the Orthodox form. So uh, many jurisdictions, if, if you have been given the Orthodox form of a baptism that is, that is close enough, like with water in the name of the Trinity, uh, then the grace is given to you through uh, the anointing with holy chrism. So it's not that we accept baptism baptisms outside of the church we don't accept sacraments or mysteries outside of the church we accept the form it's an orthodox form it's just somebody non-orthodox did it uh, and what you whatever grace is lacking whatever needs to be healed which god knows uh is, is done through chrismation so uh, and some people are even received by confession of faith it always uh it depends on the kind of the schism or heresy that a person comes from and that is, and how a person has been received specifically has changed at different times in different places uh, throughout history. It's really up, up to the bishop. So, 
So now we're going to talk about some very practical things that we can do. And you'll notice all of these have to have to do with the priest. And the priest is not always necessary. Uh, it's just, as I said before, uh, as the director of, of uh, evangelism and outreach at St. George, uh, and I'm, this, I, this is my responsibility, this project, it is, uh, I'm available, right, as much as I can be available. So these things don't require a priest, but uh, uh, the importance of me being there often, first of all, people need to meet a priest, that's important, uh, as they go through the journey, uh, but a lot of times it takes the pressure off anybody really feeling like they need to know uh, all of the, um, you know, all of the answers to the questions. So one of the things you can do, this is very basic, very basic, very practical things that we can do if we want to talk to someone about the faith. And one is you just invite people to dinner, right? There's something called Ask Abuna. Abuna is the uh, Arabic term for father, for priest. So you'll, you will see, we will have events that will say, ask a, you know, ask a buna, just means that it's a Q&A for the priest, uh, or ask Siedna. Siedna is uh, the, uh, means our master, is what we call the bishop uh, informally. So sometimes we have a bishop in town, you might see, uh, ask Siedna. Uh, and it's very, it's very simple, right? It's, it's having people, you know, go, going out uh, to lunch or to dinner in, in your home or a restaurant, and talking about the faith. And, and the one thing, as I said before, that I, I'm a big fan of is letting people know, right? That you, know, that you want to invite them to dinner to talk to the priest. And you may tell them, you, I mean, you can have a very particular question you're interested in, and you can ask that person if they have any particular questions they like to ask a priest, right? I don't like the bait and switch. We're like, let's go to dinner. And then like the priest shows up. <laughs> And I'm like, whoa, like, you know, they feel like they've been cornered and held hostage or something, you know, uh, there's no reason to do that. Right. There's, there's really no reason to do that. And um, um, we could just be, be honest with people about that. The priest is going to be there. Uh, and, you know, uh, just so people don't feel like they're being, you know, one has been pulled over. On them. I've, I've had a, a situation where somebody says, Hey, can you have, uh, can you have lunch on this day? So I'm like, yeah, I can have lunch. And then later on, they're like, oh, by the way, I'm inviting these other people to lunch with us. And I knew, wow, well, they're, you know, th this changed really fast because they're going to ask me to do something, right? They, <laughs> they have a, they have a project they want me to be involved in. And sure enough, so, um, you know, we just just be honest with people. Uh, So this is something that actually is going to happen, God will. Uh, and and it, it kind of unfolded before I could even talk about it. Someone has uh, offered to have every month a dinner in their home and invite those who are inquirers who are new to St. George, who are catechumens at St. George, uh, and those of us who are part of this uh, mission and evangelism effort to bring the gospel to everyone. Uh, so that new people can meet people that have been there a while, right? And we can really build a community. And, and that's a great venue. If you know someone that might have a question uh, or might be interested to bring them along. I mean, it's, it's great. You know, uh, I occasionally have people in my home. We had a Chinese New Year party not too long ago. And, uh, we don't always talk about theology, all right? I mean, you know, we, we talk about our lives, right? In our life, if we're living the Christian life, our life is in Christ, and, and, and we can be together, and, and you know, a, 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 something theological may come up uh, that we talk about, but maybe not, you know, and that's okay. You know, part of, part of introducing people to Christianity and orthodoxy is, is to let people know that we are like, we're real people, you know, and that we, we don't fit the stereotype of people who like put on airs that we want everybody to think we're, you know, like, like holy when we're not right. We're honest. Uh, and we're about to enter Lent where we get really honest about all of our sins. Um, 
because the services of the church help help them, you know, help bring all these sins to mind. And, um, you know, we live in a world with people where people are hurting and they need to be around people that know what that feels like and, and are willing to express that. As I said, if you're an addict, you'd rather hang around with people that are in recovery than people who just don't understand how anybody could ever be an addict. Right. And I'm just going to judge you. So uh, these monthly dinners, I don't know where they're going to start, but I'm really excited about this because this is huge. This, it's about building community. In a big church like St. George, uh, it is, it's easy often to get lost, in, especially socially, you know, because there are so many people. During COVID still, there are some people that I don't even think have really started coming back regularly again, but it's a very large congregation. This is a way to really uh, form a community and help new people uh, get to know uh, and make make connections. Um, you know, I like to have coffee, boba tea with the priest. It's kind of the same thing, uh, a little more informal. You know, if uh, I did this, actually, I took some college students to Torchies uh, not too long ago, a few months ago. And um, with COVID, I feel like I've lost a few years. But uh, in the past, you know, I've, I've uh, taken people just like to have tea. And to talk about these things. I mean, this is, this is, it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? And part of what I'm telling you is that evangelism is not like you and somebody else. Like you have to have all the answers, right? It's really bringing people into a community who are experiencing orthodoxy. And when you have a priest there, uh, you might get at least longer answers, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully better answers. But, um, and, you know, this, I put this in here because this came up recently. Somebody told me uh, that they have been part of a Bible study with non-Orthodox women. And I'm like, this is great, right? Um, you know, if there's a way that we can connect these people who clearly have a real interest in the scripture with uh, the women from our group, right, who have an Orthodox perspective and things. Uh, then that's another way of introducing people to the to the ancient faith. And uh, there's also private lunches, right? It, you can we can do a big group, or you can just say, "Father, send me and have this person." Let can you have lunch? That's all it takes. It's very easy. It's very easy. I, and and sometimes sometimes we're able to make some headway. Sometimes we're not. I mean, I had I had a lunch. Uh, one of the, our parishioners had a friend who's a Calvinist. We had lunch. I don't think that went anywhere, <laughs> but, uh, but that was one lunch, right? We have to realize it's a process. Uh, I, may, I think I spoke in the past maybe about the process that I had of going to a Greek church, which was not really helpful for me, um, at least at the time, and then meeting one of these uh, evangelicals who um, became an Orthodox priest, who became head of our uh, missions and evangelism department. When I was in a Protestant seminary, I met him uh, as he spoke. And, uh, and then later on, went to a Greek festival. Uh, and it turns out, interestingly, as I came into Orthodoxy, my mom realized that back in West Virginia, she knew Orthodox people that went to the cathedral right, right down from the federal court building where she worked for over 30 years. Uh, so when she went to church with me, uh, in, in, in West Virginia, when I go back and visit, and I wasn't raised in that church, in the cathedral, I was way, raised in a Protestant church. But when I would go visit, my mom would know people, like she had no connection with the Orthodox Church, but she knew Orthodox people and never realized they were Orthodox, right? Uh, so it's just, it's amazing, this, the web of relationships, how it all works. And it's amazing the, the process sometimes. Uh, you know, when I talk about becoming Orthodox, I can make it sound like you know, I just snapped my fingers and decided, but it, it's often a long process and involves a lot of things. So uh, it, we often, with the first contact, right, you know, some, some plant, right, some water, and, and some take the increase, right? So um, sometimes the first few times we're just really cultivating um, a, a person's uh, interest in deeper spirituality. And I'll say even with some of you may have experienced this, sometimes going to liturgy, it takes, it takes a few times where we become comfortable enough to really start learning. You know, as somebody from a 
a kind of an academic uh, theological background too. I like I was always judging, you know, <laughs> until we want to realize that I'll let the church judge me, <laughs> you know, on what basis am I, am I studying a way of worship that's been by, been you know done continually since the fourth century, you know, um, because I, I, I'm I'm the guy who put the screen in the church and you know wanted the band. I'm that guy. That was a long time ago. I'm not that guy anymore. But uh, but I like talking to those guys. Uh, you know, one thing I do is sometimes is, is people will come to me and say, you know, I have this relative or this friend uh, and they want to learn, you know, can you show them around the church? St. George is like one of the best churches ever for talking about spirituality uh, and, and talking about the relationship between worship and sacred art and, and the ancientness of the church, all of these things. So can always do that and then go have lunch or something. People have questions. I mean, or, ju or just stop by at a lunch hour. I mean, it's, it, it, it's incredible. Uh, but it's St. George is like one, just one big visual aid about ancient Christianity and, and spirituality. And another thing we can do is like, I've done it before. If people are interested in book studies, where we read a book and we talk about it and it can be a Zoom discussion or get together. That sort of thing. So these are just some very basic things. Um, bringing people to Vespers. I, you know, I'm not one usually to invite people to liturgy. I usually invite them, at least initially, to Vespers because it's quieter. Uh, and uh, it sometimes helps before Vespers. We can talk to them about what's going to happen so they know. And then uh, explain to them uh, maybe afterwards uh, and answer questions afterwards right and and it's also important bringing somebody to vespers you know you can sit with them you can kind of be there and and if they have any questions or you know show, to help them find out where they are i'm not a big fan of using the books uh because the visual part i mean we, we come from a very bookish culture uh but the visual part of orthodoxy is what's going on right the only people that need books really are people like the chanter stand and the priest and, and, you know, our, our eyes are not really to be stuck in the book, but sometimes people want to, uh, you know, see what's going on. But, the, but you know, if you're interested and you don't know, I can show you where you can find the Vesper service online every week. Uh, if you try to use that little book, it's, it's not correct because the variables in there, uh, there's, they change every week. So what's in the book is it's not going to be correct for that week, probably. Um, Again, it's just, it's, it's a lot of different contacts, right? A lot of different roads lead people to the faith and to deeper spirituality. And we have to keep, keep trying, you know, and uh, do everything we can be resilient and persevere. You know, um, it's okay to, to feel like we, if we do something and it fails, right? We, we maybe did not do it correctly, maybe not at the right time. Uh, or maybe we need to change what we're doing and do something different. And, that, and that's all okay. We just have to, you know, the Great Commission lives on. So if we try something that doesn't work, we just try something else. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was just at a, at a sacred art festival in Dallas over the weekend. I was assisting uh, His Grace Bishop Thomas. And uh, this sacred arts festival, I think it was far more successful than they ever imagined it to be. It was amazing. Uh, a lot of people there. And it was really different Orthodox artists. They had uh, a choir singing and a lot of visual arts icons and, and uh, contemporary art as well, in addition to icons. It was really, uh, really something. Okay, let's see. And, and you know, again, I want to really want to reemphasize when we're talking about evangelism, you know, it, it's, first of all, it, it is, it is not arguing with people, right? Uh, I never find that, that very helpful anyway. Uh, but remember that evangelism and, and outreach generally, outreach is broader than evangelism, right? So uh, this particular series really focuses more on evangelism. Uh, but outreach is about loving our neighbor, right? It's about uh, really being the hands and feet of Christ in the world. And it's a lot more than evangelism. But the one thing that the church offers is the experience of the transforming grace of God that nobody can do, right? Uh, you can have the, you know, the secular humanist society who can go out and feed the poor, right? That's our job as Christians, but they can do that. They can feed the poor, but they can't give people the grace of God. So evangelism is at the very core uh, of what we offer people, and that is to transform their lives. And, 
it's an expression of our spiritual lives. So we have to constantly be living the spiritual life, living a life of, uh, you know, repentance and prayer and humility. And we're coming up on Lent and, and Lent is all about, it's like, it's like, you know, going to a camp, um, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with trainers and coaches who are going to be there and help you like be the most fit that you can possibly be right over a period of weeks. And it's, the, but this is a spiritual fitness. It's also physical fitness because we do a lot of prostrations. Uh, so uh, we're coming up on this time, but evangelism is not, it's, it's just an expression, right? We want to invite people into this experience, but how are we going to do that? And why would we do that if we're not trying to deepen our own experience, right? So we have to, we have to always be attentive to our, our own spiritual lives. I remember orthodoxy is not a, a rational philosophy. It is, it is the, the purification of the heart so that we can experience the grace of God more powerfully. So we need to be in this life of prayer and for our sake and for our family's sake. Uh, and uh, we, we pray for the illumination of others as well, that they will know uh, what we know and that they will be uh, on that same path right along with us. So I got a couple of questions that I want to answer and the 10 minutes or so that we have left that are good. And one is um, essentially, how do we deal with Protestant sort of resistance to orthodoxy? Uh, and, and, and it can be a lot of things. I understand this. Many of us understand this because we have been resistant ourselves uh, at one time. Uh, so how do we uh, deal with someone? And it doesn't have to be Protestant. I mean, Roman Catholic or, or, or a nun, right? Not like, like, a, like a monastic nun, but like an N-O-N-E, somebody with no religious background. Uh, and, and, you know, if we invite people to church or something, uh, they might think, well, you know, Christians are hypocrites, so I don't have anything to do with it. Or uh, if the Protestant, um, you know, icons freak them out. Uh, or, uh, you know, I come from a very anti-liturgical background. So they might think, oh, it's just, it's, it's, it's very just ritualistic. Uh, or it's, they, they see it as somehow legalistic. Or they watch the news and they think orthodoxy is wrapped up uh, with like Russian politics or something. Uh, so how do we deal with someone who seems to have this resistance? And, and another question I got is how, how do we uh, summarize the gospel? And uh, there are a few observations, uh, that, a few uh, recommendations perhaps I could give you. And uh, with, especially with Christians who are not Orthodox, one of the, uh, one of the biggest draws being Antiochian is that we are, we are the Church of Antioch, that our founding is in the Bible. So if you're part of Jerusalem or Antioch or, or Greece, uh, you know, the Russian church was founded uh, in uh, 988, so it's ancient. But we've been around since like a year after Pentecost as a local church. So people ask these questions. I mean, they don't know. They're like, do you guys, you know, believe in the Bible? And I'm like, we're, we're in the Bible. <laughs> we're, I mean, Antioch is where Christians were first called Christians. <laughs> And uh, the Greeks would still be sacrificing goats to Zeus if it wasn't for us. You know, we, Paul and Barnabas uh, left from Antioch to go take the gospel out in the Mediterranean world, right? What, what we read in the Acts of the Apostles and, and, and the churches that were founded that he writes his letters to, which is in much of the New Testament, it, it started at Antioch. Antioch is, is a place where you see the mission turning toward the, the Gentiles, right? So... And it's co-founded by uh, St. Peter and Paul. Peter was there seven years. It's not in scripture, but it's preserved in history. Uh, even in the West, even, in fact, I think even the Roman Catholic Church still uh, celebrates a feast called Peter in Antioch. So it, it's, it's recognized, uh, was recognized universally uh, that Peter was in Antioch. And, and Paul left from Antioch, right, as I said, on his missionary journeys. So being Antiochian, we're right there. And, and the work that we do at, at, with evangelism, we have to realize we're just continuing the work of St. Paul. 
St. Paul launched from Antioch and we're, we're still continuing. it. And we've gone beyond the Mediterranean world uh, to here in the United States. And, and that's, uh, that's a powerful thing. So uh, one thing I always try to do is to show people like orthodoxy is not this denomination out there. It is the church the founded by Christ on the apostles. And that we are within that church, one of the most ancient churches next to Jerusalem, the church of Antioch. So as Antiochian, it's a little bit easier. And, and that seems to break people's minds. It's really funny. It's almost like the, the, the mind stops working. It, it's, it's hard to process for some people uh, that the ancient church is, is just fundamentally still here and has believed and done the same thing uh, for 2000 years. It take, I don't know. It took me just a while for, to really let that really let that sink in. But, uh, but, but that's, that's really important. When we're talking to, to people It's like, you know, we've been around since 34 and we have a consistent faith. And in order to understand the church and why the church does what it does, we really have to even go to the, into the old Testament, uh, and, and follow the story of Israel into the new Testament, the gospels and the acts, the apostles, and on into church history and everything makes sense. Uh, but if you're starting, uh, you know, within a perspective that has only existed within the last 500 years, it's really hard to understand uh, what orthodoxy is. But if, if people are interested enough, then, then they can learn that. Uh, and one question I have, and we, we have to be delicate when we talk to people about or, or bring this up is, is really like, how, how much does the person really know about orthodoxy? I, I would guess probably very little. I, I, you know, was taught a little about, a bit about orthodoxy uh, on a bachelor's level, master's level, and uh, at, at least on a master's level, uh, at a Protestant seminary. And the way they taught orthodoxy is not at all the way I understand it from within the Orthodox Church. So people have a, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of stereotypes. And the question is, are they really willing, are they open-minded enough to uh, accept that their uh, what they think about orthodoxy is is an incorrect stereotype that it's not accurate um and sometimes we you know if people you know if, if people think you know the orthodox you know worship icons i'm like do you think i worship an icon right? does, does that make any sense that the, the, the church founded by christ thinks that this piece of wood right is god but right? does this does this make any sense um uh, but where does this come from? I mean, it comes from, a, I mean, a lot of it comes from actually a Protestant rejection of, of Catholic, Roman Catholic station, uh, statuary and that sort of thing. Uh, so we have some explaining to do. Um, and you can express your own experience with orthodoxy uh, so that uh, the person can understand that that's, that's not how orthodox people experience it. The way it looks from the outside is not the same as the way we understand the inside there's something called the dunning kruger effect i talk a lot about and that is is essentially um people who know very little about something they they sometimes grossly under uh, overestimate their knowledge about that thing right uh people who actually do know a lot about something um have a, a sober view of what they know and they also have a, a greater recognition of what they don't know Right. But but people who know very little think they know a lot. I mean, that's certainly true in the realm of, of immunology today uh, and, and medicine. But it's it's true of uh, theology. Certainly. So um, a lot of people really think they know about they might they might know about the early church. They might know about uh, Constantine and his, his relationship with the church and all these things. They really don't. They really don't know much at all. Uh, we have to be very gentle with them, but but sometimes very gently we can begin, begin teaching them. And, uh, you know, I want to bring up one of my favorite stories I alluded to it earlier, and that is the story of uh, St. Nicholas of Japan, his first convert, uh, St. Nicholas there on the left, uh, was a Russian missionary enlightener of Japan, equal to the apostles. And uh, he encountered a samurai. This is during one of the great uh, anti-foreigner uh, movements in japan uh, a similar movement of course was in china uh we have 222 chinese martyrs in the boxer boy uh but this this samurai 
uh, challenged uh, St. Nicholas and uh, Nikolai. And uh, St. Nicholas said, you know, do you know what I teach? <laughs> like, foreigners must die. He said, do you know what I teach? And he didn't have any idea, really. So he came to hear him. And uh, there is a picture of the man uh, on the left is him as a samurai. And uh, on, on the right there is him as an Orthodox priest. He later not only became the first convert uh, to Orthodoxy in Japan, but became uh, Father Paul Sawabe, the, a, uh, an Orthodox priest in Japan. So you know, this, is, this is a legitimate question, right? Do you even know, do you know what we teach? Um, we're running out of time. I really wanted to talk about icons very specifically. To give you a summary, you know, if people reject icons, this is, you don't have to know everything, like I said. Um, in orthodoxy, you know, uh, you should ask the priest or you should ask the bishop are actually legit answers for a lot of things. But, you know, uh, to give you a summary how we can explain this to people, right? In the Old Testament, uh, God commanded that no image be made of him, but he also commanded that the Israelites make the, the holiest item in the world was the Ark of the Covenant, and he told them to make two golden statues of cherubim and put it on top. And he told them to make images within the temple. And when Solomon built his temple, not only did you have a golden box with statues on top, right, which was God's throne, but he had these giant statues of cherubim that filled the entire Holy of Holies to overshadow the Ark of the Covenant. So God was not against even statues, uh, or, and, and certainly not the images that were carved into the walls of the, of the Holy Temple. And... Uh, God forbade an image of himself in the Old Testament because he had no image, but he took an image in the incarnation. And this is why the church uh, has an images of Christ, right? That's why we can have an image of God is because God became a human being that people could see and people could image. And, uh, you know, it, it, it should give people pause that the, the whole worldwide church in 787 uh, affirmed the use of icons in the churches and described exactly the distinction, we venerate icons, right? But we worship God alone. And if we kiss an icon, we are actually giving veneration to the saint or worship to God uh, that that icon represents. It's sort of like if I'm on a long trip and I have a picture of my kids and I kiss my kids on the picture. Like I'm, I know that that photograph is not my children, right? And <laughs> I know like I'm, I'm not like kissing like the ink, right? That's not where my heart is kissing, right? I'm kissing my children uh, by kissing the photograph. So, and God knows this, right? So uh, this, was, this was confirmed in 787. And the restoration of the icons uh, after another period of iconoclasm happened in 843, which we, the first Sunday of Lent in the evening, we will go to a church. Uh, we, we rotate which church it is every, every year. And all the, all the Orthodox jurisdictions, Serbs and Romanians and Russians and Greeks and Antiochians. We, we all try to get together if we can uh, and celebrate the final restoration of icons. Uh, so it's, I mean, the use of icons is ancient. There's actually an ancient synagogue in Dura Europa filled with biblical images, biblical icons. No icon of God because they don't believe he became incarnate. And, and the icons actually defend Christ's uh, divinity and his humanity. If you understand, especially the icon of Christ with his mother, emphasizes that he is God and, without beginning uh, and that he is born of a human woman and is one of us. So he is, um, however, the Father and the Holy Spirit of God, he is God. And whatever makes us human, he is human. So, so th there are those uh, explanations we can have, but ultimately we can tell people about our own experience with icons if we have experience with them, right? Uh, and, and that goes a long way. Uh, because again, people have, uh, they, they kind of see these things as sort of like cold doctrine and they're not, I mean, these things are for our use in the church, uh, that, that we can heal. And I just want to do this very quickly because I know it's eight Oh three. Um, you know, when we come to summarizing the gospel, there's no one way of summarizing the gospel. We can read, I mean, we can read the, what, what St. Paul is doing and that summarizes the gospel. What St. Peter says that summarizes the gospel. Um, but the creed is a summary of the gospel in a lot of ways, right? Uh, it's, the creed is actually called the symbol of faith. Uh, but there are a lot of different ways. And, and uh, we see, in, as we talked about earlier in the Acts of the Apostles, we can talk about uh, the gospel in terms of Christ's victory 
over uh, death and Hades and the evil powers and how he destroyed their power and the power of death. Uh, we can talk about it. I talk a lot about uh, the summary of the gospel within terms of medicine, uh, that we fell in sin. Through sin, we fell into death. Death meaning not just physical death, but, but spiritual death, spiritual sickness. And Christ came in order to heal us from death, right? He died so that death might be destroyed and raised our human nature to immortality and raised our human nature up to the height of heaven. Right. And, uh, or we can talk about it as, as a returning to paradise being uh, cast out of the garden so that we would not eat of the tree of life in a state of sickness and death, but that we would return uh, to paradise and eat from the tree of life and eat for, and live forever. So there are a lot of, depending on the, on the, on the people we are talking to, right. If I'm talking to, uh, you know, somebody who's a Baptist and I'm talking to somebody who's a Wiccan, I will probably talk about it differently, right? If, I, if somebody knows the Old Testament or if they have no idea about the New Testament, I will probably summarize it differently. As I said before, Peter and Paul, they talked about a lot about the Old Testament and how that's fulfilled in Christ. Um, but when they talked to the pagans in Athens, they didn't mention anybody in the Old Testament or even Jesus by name. Right, so uh, it's a very different way. It was the same gospel. Anyway, I don't want to keep us too long, but anybody have any burning questions you must have asked right now? I hope this is helpful for you. I try to keep this well, not, not right now, but maybe like next week, could we get like a brief description of theosis since I know it's running late or whatever? No, oh, I'd love and, to. Yeah, because that is salvation, right? I mean, really, uh, when we talk about theosis, that is certainly a summary of the gospel. Uh, in fact, I thought about the phrase from Athanasius, right? God became man that man might become God. Like, what does that mean? We don't mean it like we become like Zeus. We don't really mean it in like in a Mormon sense that we like become a God and can start our own, you know, planet or something. Uh, it means by grace, right? We become like Christ. We experience the grace of God and, and are um, really re reach the fullness of what we're meant to be as human beings uh, by God's grace. And I, I thought about that phrase and putting that on here, but I didn't. But now you forced me to go there. So uh, next week, next week, oh, we'll, pro we'll probably right. limit, uh, uh, not um, meet maybe during Lent. I'll probably do some videos actually to maybe explain what's going on during Lent for some of you that might not know. Uh, and just send the, the video links out uh, to you, because if you come to all the services of Lent or as many as you can, we're going to be busy uh, and we'll be tired. And that's that's great. The more we get into, into Lent, the, the better Pascha is. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I, I was going to ask about because um, I've had some some people who uh, tell me that um, whenever you you um, I mean with the saints that is idolatry. I mean not idolatry, but they use a scripture that says "quote unquote" um, talking to the dead is an abomination to God. "Quote unquote," and so I'm not saying I'm for the apologetic sake, but just like I know that it's not, but I don't know the why behind it. Right? Why it's not? And so, yeah, we'll well, the, share with us later. Right, right. I mean, yeah, I, I will say this that, you know, the saints for us are our family, right? And the church, those that have gone before us and those that are here, we're one big family, part of the same church. And that veil is very thin, right? And, and, and the talking to the dead is actually necromancy, right? If you're talking to the dead and trying to get, you know, answers from the dead uh, as an occult practice, right? But those who are in Christ, there's no, there's no one who is dead in Christ. Right in the in the sense that those who go beyond are alive uh, with Christ, awaiting the resurrection of their body. Right at the end of the age. So uh, you know, for us, they're asking a saint, for example, to pray for us. Uh, first of all, honoring the saint is what we're what we're doing is we're honoring one who has really given themselves over to Christ. Right, which is we aspire to, uh, and we and 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 what we see in them, what makes them saints, is the presence of God right? Uh, it's, it's not anything about themselves. It's the presence of God radiating through them. That's why we put lights in front of them. We paint, you know, put gold halos around them. That's, that's God's presence within them. And they're moved by the Holy Spirit. And to ask somebody, you know, ask a saint to pray for us, it is very much just, if somebody's in the church, let's just say, you know, let's just say you're a Baptist, right? And you say, you know, my sister is sick. Will you pray for my sister, Bob? You would not expect Bob to say, no, 
I will not pray for you because there is one mediator between God and man. You pray directly to Jesus, right? Now, I mean, nobody do that. They say, sure, I'll pray for you, right? We pray for each other. I mean, it, God teaches us dependence on each other by praying for each other, right? That was my West Virginia accent coming out. But, yes, sir. Um, right? So, so when I ask a saint to pray for me, and when we talk about praying to the saints, you know, prayer means a request, right? So what we're doing is we're actually asking for intercession for the saint uh, who's in heaven to give us intercessory prayer. And there's no difference in doing that uh, and asking a saint on earth, like one of our fellow believers, to pray for us. Right. So we're just a big family. And that's what the saints do in heaven is that uh, or when, being with Christ uh, is that they intercede uh, for the world. And we see we actually see in Revelation, you know, the saints saying, how long, O oh Lord, to we're avenged, you know, all the, you know, all the martyrs. And we have this incredible scene of, of an angel with incense and these bowls of incense and the, the, the prayers of the saints rising to God. And there's this scene where the censor is like, you know fiery center with smoke is like whirled to the earth there's an earthquake you know i mean the prayers uh, of the saints are powerful and again what makes them saints is 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 god's presence they have no power right we ask that you know sometimes the theotokos to use her power what does that mean i mean she doesn't have like power it's their power of intercession right we ask her to use her boldness as a mother to uh to pray to her son and our god for us uh, and, and her arms are up in the icons, you know, the big icon of St. George, because what's she doing? She's praying for us. We call her the champion leader. We'll, we'll use that term during Lent. There's a beautiful hymn. And what that means is she is the one with John the Baptist, right? It's his mother and his cousin uh, that, that we see as the leaders in intercessory prayer, leading all of the saints in heaven, intercessory prayer for those of us who are still here. So it's, it's like asking somebody. On, on earth now the thing is they don't they don't see it like that because they don't understand that the saints are our family you know and we have all the icons of them in the church to remind them when we worship they're they're with us and with the angels uh they're with us in worship you know the whole the whole church is together in the liturgy even though we celebrate at different times all over the world there's really one one heavenly liturgy that we all participate in so that's a kind of a quick answer i think so Anyway, uh, if you guys have any more questions, you can send them to me. Um, and uh, any, any follow-up questions, we, we can meet uh, next week. But like I said, after that, we'll probably take, uh, take a break for a while because Lent is, is really busy. And uh, we can still email. If you ever have any questions individually uh, for me, please email me. Uh, and uh, I try to get back with you. If I, never, if I don't email you back, uh, at some point, it's not that I'm ignoring you. I probably lost the email in the gazillion emails I get. So just email me again. Uh, and I really try to answer all of your questions uh, the best that I can. But uh, hopefully as we go forward, we really uh, will, uh, especially after Lent, when we, uh, Lent's about us, right? Really uh, healing our souls and, and getting ourselves back into spiritual alignment uh, that we will you know, be rejuvenated so that we can deepen our experience and invite other people into that experience of the Holy Trinity too. All right, good night, everybody. And uh, God willing, I'll see you all soon. Good night, Father Sam. Good night, Father Sam. Good night. Thank you, Father Simeon. You're welcome. <laughs> good night. Good night. Hey, Leland.